This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the podcast. This episode is sponsored by GardenCourses.com. GardenCourses.com offers online horticultural training for those looking to develop their own home gardens. There are three courses available online this month. Small Space Big Harvest, Creating an Urban Wildlife Garden, and Four Seasons of Colour in Your Garden. Go to GardenCourses.com to find out more. In this week's episode, I'm speaking to Fiona Edmund of Green Island Gardens about one of the stars of the winter garden, the Hamamelis, aka Witch Hazel. We talk about their cultivation and go through some of the foolproof and some of the choicer varieties. And I'll be amazed if you don't do a bit of Hamamelis shopping even just of the online window variety, after listening to Fiona. Fiona begins by telling the story of how she came to acquire Green Island Gardens, home to a national collection of hammermellis. Originally, I was a garden designer working in London, had two small children, and I was also playing golf on the amateur circuit. And unfortunately, in 1995, I was struck down with a horrible debilitating illness, ME, and forced to come and live up in Essex with my parents. Uh, My mother had to take care of the children because I was bed bound for six months and house bound for three years, basically. Um, Eventually, we were, well, I was well enough for us to try and find a property of our own because we'd sold our house in London. And um, we came upon this weird place, um, wasn't at all what we were looking for but it it was close to my parents which was um, important because um, we had mum and dad had to be on call at short notice to come and help look after the kids when I wasn't well and so we found this place which was 20 acres of really destroyed woodland it had been destroyed in the 1987 hurricane and left untouched since so um, we took it on not really with the intention of ever developing the garden Um, but it it sort of happened very very slowly as I my health improved gradually we cleared a little bit to be a family garden sort of one acre in the middle of the plot and then um, it just developed in stages from there as as we moved outwards and cleared a lot of the fallen trees and the sycamores that had sprung up. Uh, and it was it was a very enclosed piece of land, triangular. Nobody had been allowed in. No one could see in. And we weren't really well enough. I wasn't well enough for us to socialise. So nobody came in and enjoyed the garden. And it was at that point I thought, well, I'll just do a couple of open charity days and see what the response was. So did that. um, Very, very popular. So it just sort of grew. It, it, It was like a seed that was sown and it's grown over 25 years. And we've now cleared the entire 20 acre plot. So it's all garden, um, the woodland style, informal. Um, and, and the hammermellis are part of that. Mm. And you, I believe you've also got the National Collection of Camellias. Is that right? The National Collection of Autumn and Winter Flowering Camellias. Ah, okay. Not the spring flowering. There are so many hundreds and thousands. I don't think anybody could have a national collection <laughs> of all of them. Um, but yes, I've got a collection of autumn and winter flowering camellias. So we've got over a hundred of those as well. And did you have those because they were a pre-existing interest of yours or did they come about because they, they suited the site? Well, I always loved hammermellis. I fell in love with those when we lived in London. And I, th- I always describe to people, I was a bit like a caged bird, I think, in London, um, having been brought up on a farm and, and loved the outdoors. And I used to go, we live very close to Richmond Park. And in the middle of winter, I used to go into Richmond Park. And there's a lovely garden there called the Isabella Plantation. And I would go in in the middle of winter when everywhere around had no flowers, no leaves. It all looked very stark and bare. And in Inside there was just this oasis of colour and scent with the hammermellis uh, in the middle of the winter. And I just thought it was so magical. I fell in love with them there and then, really. And so when we moved here and I started planting the garden, that was when I got my first hammermellis. And um, that that was Hamamelis intermedia pallida, a lovely pale yellow cultivar with a beautiful scent. And then I discovered that there were other coloured ones as well. So I had to have some of those. Um, so I sort of added a few to the garden. And each time we developed a bit more of the garden, um, a few more went in. 
And I've always, as a designer, it was always an ambition to have a garden that looked good for 12 months of the year. Um, so many people just have their garden. They sort of come alive at Easter when the weather gets good and they plant up their garden. They go off to the garden centre, fill it up, fill their trolley up with all these bedding plants for the summer. And then you see all these posts and questions will come in to garden experts. What can I do to make my garden look better in the winter? You know, it looks really drab. So for me, the garden has to look good 12 months of the year. Um, so the hamamelis were very important in that and I then discovered that there were camellias that flowered in the autumn I, ha I didn't know about them until we came here but once I discovered one of those I thought my goodness this is amazing planted my first one and it flowered in the end from the end of September and it was still going in January and I thought this is incredible it's far better than a, a spring flowering camellia which they, they tend to flower just for maybe a month in the spring and if you get frosty mornings the, the blooms are all spoiled anyway so then you've got 11 months of a pretty boring shrub but the autumn flowering camellias they'll flower for almost four months and they're beautifully scented and the flowers are not spoilt by the frost added to that they're much easier to grow than the spring flowering ones they're slightly more tolerant of non-acidic soils and they'll grow in full sun as well so they're just a much much better plant and um Having discovered those, I sort of started adding a few more. We kept developing more and more woodland and the, and the plants that the hamamelis and the camellias are particularly suited to those um, environments and the soil we've got here. So this, it's just seemed like a, an obvious addition to, to the garden. Mm. Yeah, it definitely does. So obviously, as you said, the camellias is, is a broad genus, very, you know, very many species, presumably within that and cultivars. Um, is yeah. it the same with the hamamelis? Is that quite so well, complex? Uh, not as not as many as the camellias. Um, broadly speaking, that, that in cultivation, there's two American types, Vernalis and Virginiana. And there's the Japanese uh, hamamelis japonica and hamamelis mollis, the Chinese. And most of the cultivars that are on sale and available and, and in people's gardens are hybrids between the Japanese and the Chinese um, species. And they are labelled as hamamelis ex intermedia. And that's what the majority of hamamelis that you'll see um, in in Britain uh, are those hybrids and they're nearly all grafted um, plants so it makes them expensive and slow to propagate as well so quite expensive when people buy them but they are worth every penny. Yeah that actually you've answered one of my questions that was coming later um, they are they are quite pricey but that explains it so um, again that that was a later question but we might as well talk about it now um, propagation yeah. That sounds yes. quite difficult then. That's not straightforward. No, it's not. They're grafted. Although, I mean, there are nurserymen who that's all they do is graft hamamelis and they'll say that they get a really good um, uptake percentage. Um, it's not something I've got into yet. I haven't got the time or the space to do it. And, and I'm specialising in so many other plants, not just the hamamelis. So I do tend to buy a lot of my grafted ones in to sell on but hopefully I will get into that with some of the more rare varieties that are just not commercially available um, but just because of the time the input and uh, the fact that they are relatively slow growing as well does make them very expensive but I always say to people um, if you think of buying a plant just compare it to um, buying a, bu a bouquet of flowers if you send a bu bunch of flowers or go to the florists and buy a bunch of flowers for your wife your mother your granny or whatever it's going to cost you 20 30 quid even more perhaps and people just they balk at the prices of plants because they don't look so much i think they might go and buy one in the middle of winter when it hasn't got any flowers or leaves and they think oh why am i paying 30 quid for this this twig in a pot but what they don't realize is the potential of it and so basically you pay for what you get and the, the plants that are really expensive are the ones that are expensive to propagate and the ones that i say are the best value plants in your garden i.e the ones that will give you the most for your money and they will look good for the for the entire year so for example the hamamelis they start flowering in my hamamelis pallida starts often in november whilst it's still got its leaves on it and it will be flowering right into february and not only the beautiful flowers you've got gorgeous gorgeous scent so you can cut branches off it bring it in the house enjoy it that way as well it's a beautiful elegant shaped plant 
uh, with lovely round, sort of almost hazel-like leaves, which looks lovely through the summer. And then the autumn from September to December, you've got these beautiful buttery yellow leaves, although a lot of the other cultivars will colour orange or red. But Pallida, for example, I've just started on that one, um, these lovely buttery yellow leaves. So you've got almost 12 months of interest from that plant. So it is going to be an expensive one. If you buy an annual that's going to flower its heart out for two months and then keel over and die, and it's been raised in a few weeks, then expect to pay 50p for it. So, you know, you basically pay for what you get with your money. Mm, yeah, very true. Um, as a designer as well, uh, you know, you're you're kind of keeping an eye on what they look good against. And it's interesting that you said about obviously the autumn colour and then the, the flowering on the bare wood. Um, but when they're just in their green leaf leaf stage, is there anything they look particularly good against? Is it, you know, do you see them looking good in particular settings? No, I, uh, to be honest, I don't really notice them that much during the summer. They um, they just make a really nice foil. I would say they're really good for the edge of a woodland. They're sort of a woodlandy type plant, but in order to get the best flowering and the best autumn colour out of hammermellis, they do need to have an adequate amount of sun. So if you plant them in the deepest, darkest shade, they won't colour that well in the autumn for you. So I would sort of say on the edge of a woodland or in a mixed planting, they're really, really really good mm -hmm. but they'll, they'll make a good foil for, for virtually anything and they're not going to outgrow it uh, you know at a really fast rate um the, the canopy is sort of raised up a little bit so it underneath is perfect for planting lots of spring bulbs and things they look really pretty um, in combination with them when they're flowering mm. yeah and when they are flowering do they look particularly striking against anything <sighs> I think they look most striking against a clear blue sky, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, just a winter day. I mean, I've got them in combination with all sorts of things. They look good against evergreens. Um, again, they'll just brighten up a mixed planting of deciduous um, plants. It doesn't really matter, to be honest. They, they're, they're, they're excellent as a standalone specimen or in combination with other things. Mm. Yeah, they've got the, the presence to stand out just on their own, I guess. So Yes, um, yeah. And you mentioned, obviously, the scent of them. Are they all scented? Virtually all of them, but I would say it, it alters the scent slightly. Um, it's a sort of citrusy, spicy combination, citrusy, spicy scent. And I would say the more yellow the flower, the more lemony. The more citrus and then as you as you go through the colors if you go the the darker yellow the oranges it becomes more 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 deep spicy sort of oriental um scent but they they're all with the citrus undertones i would say sort of lemony for the yellow ones and and more towards the orangey citrusy flowers um with the orange flowers interesting and what is the color spectrum of them um, starting from the palest yellow, um, Virginiana, I would say, is the palest yellow, um, spied, very thin spidery petals. Um, and then going right through the, the, the rainbow of, of yellows, going into orange, all through the oranges, coppers to red, a really, really dark maroony red. And then standing aside from that there is there's one called amethyst hamamelis vernalis amethyst which is the only true sort of purpley um colored one that sounds interesting i haven't seen that one yes that yeah um <laughs> do they all like the same soil and aspect as well can you be quite general about that Pretty much, yes. So they're, they're relatively easy to grow. But I mean, like a lot of plants, ideal conditions will be a moist but well-drained soil, which sounds a bit contradictory in itself, um, implying that it, 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 it requires a soil that gets regularly watered but is never waterlogged. So they wouldn't do well in really, really heavy clay. You would have to add a bit of loam and gravel or grit or something to that. Haven't tried them on, on thin chalk saws, but they probably wouldn't enjoy that. They can be grown quite successfully in pots for many years and if they're, they're slow growing, so they don't really tend to outgrow their pots. Um, and if they do, you can prune them back quite successfully. Um, so yeah, pretty much any soil. And as I say, um, 
the the full sun aspect, the more sun you give them, the better colour you're going to get in the autumn. But then it's a trade off because they're likely to suffer slightly with drought. But having said that, all my hamamelis here, they, they've never wilted. We've had incredibly dry summers the last three years. And none of them, once they're established, they're absolutely fine. They're actually quite drought tolerant, a lot more than the labels would have you believe and where you find them in their native habitats. Mm. And they're all hardy, are they? Absolutely fully hardy. And that was one of the things that really captivated me with them, that the fact that those flowers are so incredibly resilient to anything that the winter weather can throw at them. A lot of the flowers you see at this time of year, some of the camellias, all the viburnums, you get those really hard frosts and the flowers are just totally wiped out and brown and mush. But the hamamelis are just totally uh, resilient to anything however cold it is as soon as it comes above naught degrees again the flowers open up totally totally unspoiled mm. they're incredible yeah and the other thing about the scent of them is that um they're very clever releasing their scent we, we assume that they produce the scent for our benefit but they don't it, it's their mechanism of attracting pollinators to them and in the winter when it's cold there aren't many pollinators around so the plants have to be even more clever in giving off even stronger scents in order to attract those those few pollinators and also do it over a really long period of time as well to ensure that they get pollinated so for us the, the flowers that the, the, the shrubs that flower in the winter you're getting much more value because you're getting months of the scented flowers rather than something like a lily in the summer which will flower for a couple of weeks and then it's gone yeah they are amazing things to have in the garden at this time of the year there's no doubt about it um yeah i just wanted to pick up you said that you can prune them um do yes. they need any prune, routine pruning Absolutely not. No, there's lots of mine that, that, that don't get pruned. The only thing I would say is that because a lot of them are grafted, you do very, very frequently get sucker growth from below the graft coming up. So you will actually get the rootstock, which has nearly always been Hamamelis virginiana, one of the American varieties that they use as the rootstock. And you'll find shoots of that coming up. And in one season, they can actually overtake the entire height of the um, the graft on top so it's really important to check every year and pull off any of those suckers from below the graft otherwise they are so vigorous that they will take all the goodness and nutrients from the plant and the graft on top will die and you'll lose your prized plant so really important to check for suckers are they susceptible to any pests and diseases that's kind of an important question i guess yeah, in pots, I would say they are susceptible to vine weevil, as are an awful lot of ornamental plants in pots. In the garden, absolutely not. They, I would say they're pest and disease resistant. I don't know of anything that attacks them or spoils the leaves or the flowers or anything. I have a checklist of positive points, plus points for plants, and I assess each plant before I put it in the garden as to how many plus points it's got. And hamamelis just ticks so many of those boxes, which for me makes it such a valuable plant. Yeah. Um, and what are some of the easiest cultivars to grow? If somebody wanted to kind of start out, what would you recommend? Yeah. Um, well, so for a yellow one, I would recommend Hamamelis ex intermedia pallida as being one of the best. Um, for orange ones, uh, Rochester is meant to be one of the best ones, but that's not that easy to get hold of. But um, either Jelena, Jelena it's pronounced, but Jelena, J-E-L-E-N-A, Jelena is a lovely one. Um, and then going for or Vesna, that's another good one. Or there's another absolutely beautiful one called Orange Peel. Uh, there's lots of orange orange ones around. And then going into the reds, um, Magic Fire. Uh, Diane is probably the best easily available one. Another nice one called Rubin, but they reckon the best one for red flowers is one called Foxy Lady which is actually, again, quite hard to get hold of. You'd have to go to specialist nurseries and sometimes go on waiting lists to get that in Rochester. But you'll get hold of Diane quite easily. And then there's another one um, which I would recommend as well for people that, that, that maybe maybe want to have a, a couple of them. Instead of going for the ex intermediates, have a look for Hamamelis vernalis sandra. So vernalis is again one of that's one of the American varieties. They're slightly different, 
they they form a more upright branching rather than uh, quite so spreading. So if you haven't got so much space, they're quite good. Um, the flowers come much later and they're slightly smaller and they're not quite as scented. But the autumn colour on those is absolutely second to none. I'd say it's the best autumn colour. Um, so that's one worth looking out for. Uh, but if you want to go for the showy flowers and the scent, scent then go with the ex-intermedia cultivars. And do you have a particular favourite? Or is there maybe it one changes. that's exciting you this year? There's one that's exciting me this year because it's a new one. With um, with all the Brexit changes, I've actually imported quite a lot of new cultivars. I got hold of everything I could from the continent to add to the collection. So they're actually still in pots. And one that's really, really exciting me that I hadn't heard about before is called Hamamelis intermediate basma. And it started flowering at the end of November and the flowers opened out from these little buds, sort of yellowy with orange tinges. And over the next month, the flowers matured until they, were, they went through all the colours of yellow, orange and almost red by the time it was fully open and mature. It's gone past now by the time most of the others are into their their full glory. But but going forward, I think that's going to definitely become one of my favourites because it's one of the earliest ones to open. And so I think I, I sort of enjoy that one even more because the others aren't all out yet. No. And so, yeah, I would say that that's my latest favourite. <laughs> I was just having a look, actually. <laughs> I just Googled that as you were talking, um, and it looks a little bit similar to one, I think that's one of my favourites, which is Aphrodite. Yes, Aphrodite is lovely as well, and that's fairly readily available. I wouldn't say it's got the richness of colour, though, that um, Basma has. Oh, interesting. Basma goes much darker, yeah. Yeah, i have to keep an eye out for that one then. Are you selling any through the nursery at the moment? Yes, yeah, we've got quite a few. I think I've got about eight or ten different varieties available and we are doing uh, limited mail order as well. Excellent. That's good to know. So is there anything that we didn't talk about that you think that we should have done? No, apart from the fact that every garden should have a hamamelis, at least one. They should, um, shouldn't yeah. they? I don't know why we don't. I mean, they're such yeah. good plants. Exactly. I mean, if people often ask me what are my sort of go-to plants or if I had to choose 10 plants and, and there would definitely be a hamamelis in there because they're just such good value plants. And which one would you say was the gave you the sort of best bang for your buck? What, what's the one that lasts the longest? Mm, probably, well, it depends. It's personal preference on what colour you want to go for and it's a trade-off. If you want autumn colour, oranges and reds you need to go for the orange and red cultivars so as with the scent that changes I would say with the yellow flowers you're more likely to get yellow autumn colour so pallida uh, really does colour a buttery yellow and you never get orange or red tints on that but if you go to the ones with the orange flowers you'll get more orange and reds and similarly the red flowers so like Diane you get beautiful bright red autumn foliage colour so it's a trade-off with the scent and a trade-off with the autumn colour and personal preference with the flower colour. Mm. I can't say that one is any better than the other. It really is personal preference. I'm just thinking if you had a small garden and you wanted to have one as a winter interest, but you didn't have a lot of room to play with, so, for yes. example, you didn't have a woodland edge. Um, yes. Can you happily put it in a mixed border and then underplant it with herbaceous stuff that will come Ooh, up in the yes, summer? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, I've got them in our main mi mixed borders, um, just directly in front of the house, not in the woodland at all. They're very happy in the borders. They're very happy planted in grass. Um, so, yeah, really, really versatile shrubs. As Fiona says, why wouldn't you have a hammer mellis in your garden? Or three? I love witch hazels, but I don't have one in my garden, which is a massive oversight, really. I think part of the problem with such seasonal showstoppers, and I class plants like Edgeworthias and Shimonanthus in this group, is that there's a great pressure to find the perfect spot in order to do justice to their wintry charms, and I'm just never that organised or deliberate in my own garden. That's my excuse anyway. Thanks to Fiona for taking part in the interview, thanks to you for listening, and thank you to GardenCourses.com for sponsoring this episode. I leave you with Dr Ian Bedford talking about fig wasps. Originating from Asia Minor... Figs have been picked, traded and eaten by people across the world for thousands of years. And besides becoming a popular festive treat, they're now recognised as a superfood, high in natural sugars, minerals and soluble fibre. Often referred to as a fruit though, 
A fig is actually an inflorescence, a cluster of small flowers with seeds that develop within a bulbous swelling at the tip of a stem. Today, commercially grown fig trees are mostly female varieties whose flowers within those bulbous swellings self-pollinate. But they'll have originated from ancient fig trees whose flowers could only be pollinated by a very special insect, a tiny stingless wasp called the fig wasp. Ancient fig trees still grow within the tropical countries today and their unique association with the tiny fig wasp reveals a truly remarkable tale of co-evolution. A biological system that, from fossilised evidence, has been going on for over 30 million years. The process begins when flowers inside the young figs begin producing a powerful fragrance that attracts the female wasps that are hatching out from older, mature figs. However, the only way the wasps can reach the flowers in the young fig is by squeezing through a tiny hole at the end, which rips off their wings. Once inside, though, the wasps are trapped and spend their final days laying eggs and pollinating the fragrant flowers with pollen that they'd collected from the old mature fig that they'd originated from. The wasps then die inside the young fig, whilst their eggs hatch into little grubs that feed and grow on the developing seeds. After just a few weeks, they pupate before hatching into new adult wasps. The males, which are wingless, appear first and wait amongst the seeds for the females to hatch. They'll then mate, and whilst the females collect pollen inside the now mature fig, the males perform their final act chewing holes through the fig wall so the pollen-laden females can escape and follow the floral scent of a new immature fig, just as their mothers had done two months previously. So in answer to the question, are there really dead wasps in a fig, then it'll be no, not in the commercial self-fertilising varieties, but absolutely yes, in the ancient varieties that continue to exist in symbiotic harmony with their special little fig wasp pollinators. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.